Brothers and sisters, greeting in the name of the Lord and blessings upon you. And once again, I have the opportunity of sharing what I started for the last two weeks. And prior to that, I've been speaking about the matter of knowing God in his various and multiple names. And each one of those names to meet a particular need in our lives. As we come to appropriate that name in our a given circumstance, we are being conformed to the image of Christ, the ultimate the goal of God, that what he decided in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. So our emphasis in this church has always been on Genesis 1, 26. But before I go on, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we come into your presence. We ask that you guide us, lead us, teach us, reveal yourself, give us understanding, give us perception, give us a spiritual understanding that we may understand what you're telling us and appropriate that particular name in our lives and go from victory to victory. I want to commit this time into your hands. I ask that you give me utterance. I, I ask that you give me guidance. Sh let me share what you sh shared with me, with your people. I want to thank you and give the glory to you in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay. So I said the emphasis of this church has all along been on Genesis, uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 1. And it begins with God saying, let's create man in our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion. But before we go that, repeatedly I've said, and to, to summarize the whole thing, God speaks, we respond, we are conformed. So I have to, some slides to share with you as we go on before we get to the topic that I want to talk to you. It's knowing God, and as we begin to know Him, uh, we will understand that man was created to know his creator. The whole Bible and our faith as Christians is based on knowing and experiencing God. It's not only a mental knowledge. It's to know him and the particular name and experience him. The Old Testament was the progressive revelation of God through different names until the complete revelation of God. God appeared in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who is he? All the names of God, every part of his character was packaged into Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus contains all the names of God because as a person contained all the characteristics of God. I want to stop here and tell you something. We say the name of Jesus contains all the names of God. There's a particular point and a name that I want to share with you today that is part and a, a, a associated with the name of Jesus, which pretty well explains all that Jesus came to do. Through Christ, knowing God became a spiritual and heavenly experience, rather than a physical and earthly experience like it was in the Old Testament. Jesus came to make the Father known to us. Everything we need to know about God is in Christ. Through our connection with Christ, which is, the, which, which is like branches that are connected to a vine, we can know God in a deeper way because we are connected to the person who is the fullness of God. The knowledge of that Christ provides, pro, the knowledge that Christ provides is one that is experiential and intellectual. Pardon me because uh, I stumble on some words. The more God reveals Christ to us and we respond to those revelations, the more we are transformed to become like Christ in character. The more we become like Christ in character, the more we can express him to the world by our love for one another. For example, people will know that we are of Christ. To summarize the whole thing, God reveals, we respond, we are transformed. That was the some slides I want to share with you. What I want to tell you today is I'm not going to preach to you. I'm going to talk to you because of what happened to me during the past week that's an experience that only by speaking to you and sharing that with you, I can share with you. I am not going to preach to you, so bear with me. In the beginning, I said this is a conference, and it's not only a preaching. So it may go on for a couple of weeks, but we will have to be patient and see what the Lord is revealing to us. So Genesis chapter 1 begins by God saying, in the beginning God created the heavens and earth, and then through a certain events that God initiated, he started to put things in such a way, prepare a habitat suitable for life 
of animal life, vegetation life. Then all the way after he restored a lot of things and created things, he came to verse 26, which is the focus of this church. And then God said, then, which means after all he has done in restoration, after he's prepared the proper habitation for life, then God said, let's make man in our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on, on, on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Basically, with all these categories that he's saying, God says, I want you to have dominion over my creation. I want you to have dominion over every sort of life. I want to have dominion on my behalf because I'm creating you in my image and likeness. However, right from the beginning, God gave humanity a free will to choose. Because without free will, man could not be conformed to the image of Christ. Because the image and the likeness of God is based on free will, choosing. And so God gave them the free will. And Adam and Eve, in exercising that free will, fell into the trap of the enemy and lost what was God had ordained for them. I'm just giving you a brief synopsis of what happened over the, all the teachings of this church. The fall of Adam and Eve because of the free will. And they delayed the purpose of God for them to be conformed to his image. Well, if we look at the flow of history, we will see all along God has been working towards this goal. Let's make man in our image according to our likeness. Chapter 1 of the book of Genesis shows what's in God's mind, what was in God's heart. And from chapter 2, the creation of Adam and Eve, the fall. And from then on, God is finding a way to restore man back to that plan and purpose. And therefore, the flow of history all along has been towards recovering man for that image and likeness. Well, God chose certain people through whom and then a nation to work with. The first thing that he did, he worked with Noah. We know the story of Noah's flood, Noah's altar. And then he chose Abraham through various trials for years and years he worked in the life of Abraham through many many situations and instances and experiences he brought Abraham finally to the point when he acknowledged the sovereignty of God and he acknowledged the power of resurrection and in many ways he was ready to put everything on the altar of God including his only son to be heir of him on the altar and therefore God swore that he's going to bless them. From then on we see the life of Isaac, Jacob and Joseph going to Egypt, sustaining the people of Israel, and eventually the nation of Israel, their progression, and eventually their fall, and not recognizing God the way they were supposed to recognize Him. And eventually, because of that fall, instead of appropriating God by various names that God was revealing Himself to these people, they chose to revert to other sources for their strength. When they came across a problem, they went to different nations. And eventually they had to bow to the gods of those nations. And finally, God did everything to restore them. It didn't work. It was to no avail. Finally, he allowed them to go into the captivity of the Babylonians for 70 years. And eventually, he allowed a small remnant from that people to return to their own land and stand on the principle of God's sovereignty and the revelation of God's name to them, prepare the way for the coming of the Savior of the world, uh, the only Son of God, Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, that's the New Testament now. I've summarized the Old Testament for you, and I've brought you to the New Testament. And as we come to the New Testament, we saw the ministry of the Lord Jesus, His death, His resurrection, His ascension, His glorification, and the sending of the Holy Spirit to give birth to the church, that one new man, that new species, that which was supposed to reveal God's image and purpose, image and likeness to the whole world. But when he sent the Holy Spirit, the church had a very unique message. And this is what I'm going to share with you. What was the message of the church to be? Is it possible 
that like the nation of Israel who missed that very point, the church is missing that very vital point in the message that God has given to us. So in the last two weeks, I'm taking you back to the last two weeks to bring you to what I'm going to share with you. And I said from the beginning, I don't want to preach to you. I want to talk to you. And I want to share with you what the Lord showed me. So we came to the Gospels, the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, we call them the synoptic gospel because they all share the same thing more or less. It more or less is the ministry of the Lord Jesus to the people of the Old Testament, to God's people, and try to recover them back to what they had missed. That's the first three gospels. He tried everything. He gave them examples. He spoke to them in many ways. But yet these people were so hardened when he spoke about him being the son of God, it really infuriated them. Israel could not possibly conceive a human being the son of God. So that created such an animosity that eventually it, it, it was such a hatred that they gave him up to Pilate, to the Romans, and they crucified him. But in all of those three Gospels, after the Lord tried everything to no avail, Eventually, towards the end of those three Gospels, he spoke to his disciples, encouraged them, and told them, he showed them after his resurrection, encouraged them, strengthened them, and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, irrespective of color, race, and incorporate them into the kingdom of God. Well, now, here is the point that I want to share with you. And then we looked at the Gospel of John. By going through the Gospel, we came across interesting sections, which I said it's revolutionary. Chapter 1 to 4 of the Gospel of John. The Lord spoke something. He was changing everything from limitation to non-limitation, from uh, a new approach of Him to us, a new way of us approaching to Him. It was revolutionary, it changed everything. So this was covered by the four chapters. I think what I'm sharing with you now, this is what I want to bring you to see, is very important if you see. Some of you may have known it, that's fine. But if you don't know it, it's very, very vital and eye-opening for us to see what I'm trying to share with you. When we study the Gospel of John, this is what I said. It is very different from the other three Gospels. I could have left right there last week because I spoke about the Gospel of John and then go back to actually go forward to the book of Acts. But somehow the Lord stopped me. He said, no, I want you to go back to the Gospel of John because there's a word there I want you to pay attention. He stopped me and when I saw that, it shook me to the very core. For 45 years being in the life of faith, did I miss that word? Did I not have a proper understanding of that word? But lo and behold, after he showed to me, I started to rejoice. I was so happy. And it was such a desire for me to share that with you, to bring you to see, and that's my prayer, that you will be as excited as I am and you will be as joyful as I am in what God is trying to show to this little church, to this small flock. That's an amazing thing that God is doing. So, in order to understand the Gospel of John, this is what I'm trying to tell you. The way it was written and when was it written. At, after we look at the New Testament properly, this is the way we see it. The three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, were written around 51 AD, 51 years after Christ. And then the letters of James were written about 45 to 50. And the letters to Peter, letters of Peter, were written about 65 AD. All the letters of Paul were written between 64 and 67. The letter of Jude was written around 68 AD. Hebrews was written around 68 AD. Ah, here comes the catch. All of them ended up by 68 AD. But the Gospel of John, his letters and the Revelation were written 95 AD. 
So why the gap? So what is John is trying to tell us? Why such a delay? And then the word. What, how do we answer this question? The question can be answered in finding out what it is John was commissioned to share with the church. What the church had missed to a certain extent. After 25 years, God said, John, I want you to go back and write. I want you to give the church the proper ability. Listen carefully. I'm reading this sentence because I've written it down. John was questioned to write that would move the church in the right direction and give the church the proper ability to withstand all the attacks of the enemy and prevent, listen very carefully, prevent any frustration, misunderstanding about the sufficiency of the necessary resources and not allow any leaven or mixture enter the church. God said, I want to show you something. John, I want you to write something. I want you to put the church on the right direction. I want them to make them understand there will be no lack of sufficiency in everything that they need to do. John, go ahead and write. John himself was one of the 12 that failed the test. When went along with the church to keep the church Jewish, in the beginning, John was one of the 12. They wanted to keep the church Jewish. As Edwin spoke for the day of Pentecost, God tried to recover that. However, after 25 years, it's as though God says to John, you better write and put things right where you also were part of them, trying to keep the church Jewish and other things. So, and I also had no option but to again take you to the John, the Gospel of John. I have to take you there because what John is writing 25 years after everything is written to assure us, give us the power, give us to know that we cannot be frustrated. Nothing can stand in the way if we properly discover a name that associated with the name of Jesus and that will give us the power to go on. So God, John's writings are the last word of God to the church. When you open the New Testament, all everything that is written, John's writings are the last. God's writings are the last word to the church. And we better understand it. We will read the synoptics. We will study the synoptics. But when we come to the Gospel of John, John is trying to tell us something. What an honor that God has chosen this church like ours to reveal the truth. I cannot contain my excitement and joy. I hope it will catch you too. Well, the Gospel of John, I have no choice but to take you to the Gospel of John. I want to take you to chapter 1 and chapter 2 and then, okay, because I'm talking, I'm not preaching, let me change my mind. I want to take you to the Gospel of John, chapter 2. Come with me to John chapter 2, because here is what really made me think. And I stood there in awe and said, what is it, Lord, that you're trying to show me? Now, here it is. When we come to the Gospel of John and the wedding of Cana of Galilee, after I finish this, I'm going to go back to John chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. But here is what, what is really got me thinking, and I hope it will get you thinking. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. I don't know, it was relatives, friends, because the mother of Jesus was there. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Why they ran out of wine? They probably they were a poor family. A rich family would never run out of wine. Here's a poor family. The mother is there. Jesus is there, they run out of wine, and the mother says to Jesus, they have run out of uh, wine. So Jesus said to her, woman, what, that, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. 
the mother knew that Jesus is not going to leave this poor family without the joy of having the wine. So, now there were there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 to 30 gallons. Now pay attention. There are six water pots, each containing to 30 gallons of water. Then Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some now and take it to the master of the feast. Master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that had been turned into wine and did not know where it had come from, but the servants knew they had drawn the water and called, and, and, yeah, and, the, and who had drawn the water. The master of the ceremony called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests are well drunk, then uh, the inferior. You have kept the better wine to the end. Now here is the word. Pay attention. This, the beginning of the signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory. And the disciples believed in him. I want to stop here. I want to ask you the question. I've asked this question many people. What was in the glory of changing water into wine? what and he manifested his glory the word that struck me is this word glory um, maybe I wish it was a conference I could stop and give you time to answer me what is what happened okay in typology a lot of you are going to tell me but a friend changing water into wine is changing life, death into life well said I love it. That's true. The question is, why six pots filled each with 30 gallons of water to be changed into wine? What was the purpose of turning water into 180 gallons of wine? Who's going to drink 180 gallons of wine? That already drunk. This is the good wine. Even if each pot had 20 gallons, that would have been 120 gallons of wine. We have to understand what that word glory meant so that from then on we can follow the message of the Gospel of John, the message of the whole Bible, and know what does that glory do for us. We've been preaching about everything. We have understood everything. Have we seen the sufficiency of the glory of God in sustaining us, providing us, stopping every limitation, every scarcity, and break through every problem. By turning water into wine, into that quantity, what Jesus told his disciples, showed his disciples, he can overcome every problem, he can stop every limitation, and he can provide over and above what we can think or ask by that power. Have we seen that power? Have we exercised that power? Has that particular name associated with the name of Jesus quality been revealed to us? Have we told people what the glory of God is? If we understand that, then we are already overcomers. And not only that, but every sign from then on in the Gospel of John, I'm not going to take you there all the time, but I'm going to take you to the four chapters because those four chapters cover a lot. Every sign, the Gospel of John doesn't talk about miracles. The Gospel of John, everything that they did is sign. A sign talking to the people that you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to give up to limitations. You don't have to go to God like a beggar. When you go and pray and see the glory of God in his church, everything, every insufficiency had been covered. Every uh, obstacle had been broken through. 
That is the glory of God. Oh, what did you think the glory was? A halo around God, a holiness. No, 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 no. The glory of God is a power that breaks through. The glory of God is what comes against every limitation. Limitations. Everything people saw at Jesus, they saw a limitation. They tried to attribute limitation to Jesus. Everything, every, <clears throat> as we go through, we will see. When he came across people with problems, they were looking at the Jesus of Nazareth and say, can he do this? Will he do this? Is it possible? The same thing that the people of Israel did in the wilderness. They were limiting his glory. Psalm 78 said they limited the Holy One of Israel. They despised the glory. They didn't understand the power of glory coming with them. Therefore, they resorted to other resources. Well, if we know that, then we can read the Gospel of John and then see what, why the Gospel was written. And then we can go back to the book of Acts and see that the church invariably in the first few years failed to preach this message the message of the glory of God. In the letter to Ephesians, Paul says, the gospel of the glory of Christ. If we go to the writings of Paul later on, we will see what happened. Chapter after chapter, the first chapters of the book of Acts speaks about that failure. Now, I want you to come with me to the book of Acts. And I, I want to show you something. In the book of Acts, I'm just briefly tell you. Because I'm going to go back to the book of John. In Acts chapter 6, constantly Satan was trying to bring in fear, limitation, somehow, somehow discord, somehow division into the church. And every time they had to face it, face it. Many things. Case in point, uh, Sapphira, Hananiah, and Sapphira. They brought a leaven into the church about finances. They sold their property. They came and said, we sold it, want to give it to the church. They were lying to the Holy Spirit. And they were coming against the glory of God, the unlimited power of God. Anyway, from then on, we come in. Then... The women brought a problem into the church. Hellenistic women, non-Jewish, and Jewish women. And the Greek women complained and said, well, the Jewish women are taking everything. They're not giving us anything. So what do the apostles do? Now, when we come to chapter 6 of the book of Acts, this is what we see. Now, in those days, when the numbers of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. A complaint against insufficiency. A complaint against limitation. A complaint to bring some division in the church. This is not Jewish and not Jewish. It is, but mostly a complaint. So what do people do? What do the apostles do? So the apostles... It is, they said, then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should have leave the word of God and serve tables. They said, we're not going to start to distribute food. We've been called into greater things. From, so out from among you seven men, seven, of good reputation, full of Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this dispute. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and then six others with him. A man full of spirit and wisdom to tackle this problem. But what a man was Stephen. What happened? 
verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. He was a faithful servant. God gave him power to do wonders and signs. And it caused jealousy. Again, the enemy tried to find a way. Again, the enemy to find a way, just as they had come against the Lord Jesus. They are finding a way to come against a man who is full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit. Then, there arose from what is called the synagogue of freemen, Cyrenian, Alexander, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. He could not. He tried to accuse him, and finally they accused him. And this is how they accused him. And they stirred up people and elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to court. They also set up a false witness and said, This man does not see speaking blasphemy, uh, blasphemous words against this place and the law. For we have heard, he says, this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs of Moses who delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looked steadfastly at him, saw his face, and his face looked like an angel. What are they accusing him of? They're accusing him of saying the same thing that Jesus said in the Gospel of John chapter 2. In the Gospel of John chapter 2, after he turned water into wine, he went to Jerusalem and tried to cleanse the temple. And they were furious against him. And he said, by what authority are you doing it? This is what Jesus said. Destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. What was he talking about? He was talking about limitation, physical limitation. He was saying, destroy this. This is not, I'm going to go back to John chapter 4 and tell you what he said to the Samaritan woman. Neither Jerusalem nor Samaria, those who worship the Father, must worship in spirit and truth. That's what Jesus was saying. And this is what Stephen was saying. He got accused on the same principle that Jesus had already spoken. Oh. I, I hope I don't cry. When I came to this chapter 7, <laughs> I said, my God, what is Stephen saying? And what happened to Stephen? This is what he said. Then the high priest said, are these things so? And he said, brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. What God? The God of glory. The God of non unlimited limitedness. The God of all sufficiency. The God of breaking through every obstacle. The God who destroys everything that stands in the way of being conformed to Christ. The God that is the most powerful. The God of glory. That's the only title that Stephen can come up with. And I said, oh my God, do we know him as the God of glory? Do we know that we're preaching the gospel of the glory of Christ? Do we have, the, have that we tapped into that? And he went on. Oh, chapter 7 shows the shortcoming. What God did with Abraham, what God did with Jacob, what God did with, with Isaac, what God did with Joseph, how God did with every one of them, how God brought them out, how Israel failed. All oh, he's narrating to them that their failure their failure, their failure, their failure. Finally, he said, why do you resist the Holy Spirit? Why don't you allow this God of glory appear to Father Abraham who work in your life? We are worshiping the God of glory. We are kept by the God of glory. We are kept and sustained by the glory of God. What is wrong with you? And he said, the God of glory appeared to our Father Abraham. Oh my God. They were infuriated that a man like Stephen is challenging them. And then what happened? 
we come to the end of chapter 7, all, after all that he confronted the Jewish people. Verse 54 of chapter 7. When they heard these things, they were cut to heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. You know, gnash is something that the dog does. Uh, they were angry at him. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. He began with the glory of God. He saw the glory of God. Nothing mattered anymore. He had said what he had to say. Does the church say the same thing? Did the church see the glory of God? Did the church look up into heaven and see the glory of God? Did the church look into the face of Jesus Christ and see the glory of God? And Jesus standing at the right hand and said, look, I see heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right of God. He's finished it. He's seen everything. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him at one accord and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. Oh my God. They closed their ears. They don't want to hear. They don't want to hear anything about the God of glory. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Later on, Paul. Oh, my God. Paul was a witness of what Stephen said from beginning to end. And eventually, God said, Paul, I think you have a good heart. I will make you continue the ministry of Stephen. And that was transformed Paul completely. He heard about the glory of God. He heard the God of glory. He heard that Stephen saw that glory. And later on, as we go through the book of Acts, we will see what happened to Paul. He went out killing a Christian, killing Christian, until on the way, road to Damascus, God stopped him and said, Paul, why are you forsaking me? And his eyes went blind because later on he said, because of the light of the glory, I could not see anymore. And he went blind. And then his eyes were opened eventually. His eyes were opened to see the glory of God. He started to preach the glory of God and he laid down his life on the glory of God. He said, you, we, each and us are called to be partakers of the glory of God all the way through. But he lost his life over that. So God is saying to John, John, you know what? You failed. Where were you when they stoned Stephen? Where were you 12? Where were you 12 when Paul was beheaded in Rome? Where were you? Where were you my two witnesses were destroyed because of your lack of understanding what the gospel was? Now go ahead and write. Now go ahead and put things right. Now go ahead and write your gospel. Now go ahead and write what I want you to write in those gospels. Now I want you to know what the church needs to do. Go ahead and write. In the Gospel of John, chapter 21, where he appeared to his disciples at the Sea of Galilee, and he spoke to them, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Three times. And eventually he said to Peter, follow me. And then Peter, looking back at John, said, what about this? Jesus said, what is that to you if I want him to remain? What was he saying? People said, maybe John is not going to die. No, no, no. He said, what is that to you if I want him to remain? I want him to remain. That later on, he is going to write and put things right. What I need to show to you. What I need to show to the church. What I need to show about the glory of God. What I want to show the power of glory in you. I'm going to keep him alive until he writes those things. Ah. It's on that basis that we need to read the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John in many ways is different. Every situation he came across, it was the glory. Changing water into wine, overflowing more and more. That's why Paul wrote to believers and said, whatever you ask, think or ask over and above what you think you're asking will give you. Because tap into that power of glory. 
tap into that name of glory. Pray for that to be a revelation for this church. And then we are on our way to complete victory and to be partakers of that glory. Oh, are you as excited as I am? Or I've gone nuts? Or I'm losing my mind? Or you're going to see as an old man, he doesn't know what he's saying. Go ahead and read the Gospel of John. Now I want to take you to the Gospel of John and read what did those four chapters reveal? What did those four chapters reveal? Let me go to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was a life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Why does the Gospel of John begin with the Word? In the beginning of the Word, everything was created through him. All through all those, those three synoptic Gospels, two of them begin with the earthly genealogy of Jesus. Matthew, look. Mark, plain simple, says the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But none of them took it back to the original where John took it. In the beginning was the Word. It's Him. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And everything was created through Him. And then, right after that, we read about the ministry of John the Baptist. This is what he says. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness to that light. That was the true light, which gave light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. I've been talking about knowing God. He was in the world, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. Oh, to the Jewish mind, becoming children of God? It is the first time that the Bible mentions being born from God. Later on, when we come to the Gospel of John chapter 3, which we will study, when Jesus met Nicodemus, he told him you must be born from above. But what was the above? In Gospel of John, chapter 1, it says, we're born of God. Everyone who believes is born from God. That's why the Jewish people went nuts, because eventually he equated himself with being the child, the son of God, and they said, he's crazy. He's calling himself the son of God. He is a blasphemer. Those, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is being born again, to be born from God. Maybe we read all, because we read this Gospel of John chapter 3 a lot of time, born from above, born from above, we cannot associate it with being born from God. And then we go, continue, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, And we beheld his glory. The glory of only begotten of the Father, full of grace. and My God, what did you see in Jesus Christ? What did you see in him? And we beheld his glory. Oh my God. The word became flesh out among us, dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father. Now here another thing comes in. It is the Father. Of glory. Now, I want to take you some. I'm jumping here and there, but bear with me. Now, when Paul was writing to the church of Ephesus, uh, this is what he knew the church is missing. And he said, And I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may. What? The Father of glory? The God of our Lord Jesus Christ? He could have said, uh, The glory. Let me figure out. Did Paul make a mistake in those words? The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. 
the glory of our, the, the God of glory, the, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, exchange the words. The God of glory, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the God may give you revelation. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't make a mistake. He was right. The Father of glory, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. He could have said the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that the God of glory and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what did he make a mistake? No. The Father of glory. Means he gives birth to glory. That your eyes may be opened and you may, that you receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of him. That your eyes may be opened, that you know what the hope of his God. The glory of his inheritance in the saints. It's about the glory, the glory, the glory, the glory. Have we missed it? Do we know what it means? to be partakers of the glory of God? Do we know that the church is supposed to be the manifestation of the glory of God that stands against any limitation, stands about any scarcity, uh, breaks through any problem, comes against anything that is trying to penetrate the church of Jesus Christ? Have we stand on that? Have we gotten hold of that one word? And the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. Chaw goes on. I'm going to finish shortly. This is two, three weeks because I'm going to take you to the Old Testament. And we beheld his glory. Chapter 2 we saw. The disciples saw his glory. I want to stop here, take you to the Old Testament, one section. And then later on we're going to study the Old Testament. When we come to the book of Exodus, God was going to take these people out to the promised land and he told Moses that my presence will go with you, don't be afraid. First he said, I'll send an angel. Moses said, if you're not coming with us, we're not going. We want you to go with us. He said, okay, my presence will go with you. And this is what Moses said. Moses the beloved of God, Moses, the servant of God, Moses who brought all the Old Testament, Moses who brought the Ten Commandments, Moses who gave the law, Moses who went up on the mountain and met God. And this is what he said. Then he said, please show me your glory. <laughs> Moses after has done everything, he says, show me your glory. What does God tell him? What does God tell this servant? What does God tell this man who has done everything? What was this man who saw manna? Who was this man who brought water out of the rock? This man is the faithful servant of God. Always the Jewish people said, Moses gave us everything. Moses, Moses. Here, Moses wanted to see that glory. Mo Mo Moses wanted to have at least a taste of that glory. And this is what God told him. And then he said to him, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Gracious, and I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see my glory and live. So it shall be, while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cliff of the rock and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by and you shall see my back but my face you shall not see. Now, my brothers and sisters, <laughs> the word very clearly said Moses wanted to see his glory because he cannot. But John chapter 1 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld, it. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Chapter 2 says, when he turned the water into wine, the disciples, he showed his glory and the disciples believed. How do we reconcile it? Everything in the Old Testament tried to see the glory. When the glory came, it was judgment. And we're going to talk about the Old Testament. A very sad stories about these people missing the glory. Now everything has been wrapped up and put in the sun. And he said, here you can watch my glory. Here you can see my glory. Here you can tap into my glory. Here you can overcome every problem and go on. And that's why when we come to Gospel of John, the first four chapters, this is what I said. This was a revolutionary teaching that John had to write back to the church and tell him by these four chapters that you now have a new way to approach God. 
God approaches you in a new way. It is all based on the glory of God and my brothers and sisters. We got to go into the Gospel of John from, from then on. Every sign that Jesus did was coming with his glory against limitation, against distortion. And how did the Gospel of John end after you read all of these things? Glory, glory, glory. What happened when you come to the book of Revelation? Glory, glory, glory. I hope I've been able to shortly as best as possible share with you the importance and the power of that one word, glory. And his disciples believed. He showed them his glory. Break limitations. Provide. Breakthrough. No need, no want. We are living in hard days. <clears throat> We're living in very difficult times. If we want to do it by any other way, we'll fail. It is to come into the revelation of the glory of God to be manifested in His church that we will overcome every problem. We will break through. We will not lack anything. That is the power of glory. When He said to His disciples, I said, take nothing with you. And when they came back, he said, did you like anything? They said, no. Even they did respond to your name. A name above all names, representing the glory of God. Remember this one word. May the Lord give us the understanding. May the Lord give us the revelation. May the Lord bring us to see this one word that will govern our life from then on, all the way through, until we enter that glory. We should already be called to that, partakers of the glory. I will take you to, later on, to the New Testament, to John New Testament, where we see the comparison of these two glories in the second letter to uh, Corinthians. And there we see we're being changed from glory to glory. May God bless you. May Please forgive me uh, if I'm overexcited or over. Okay. But I wanted you to pass on. My life has been changed. I am full of joy. I'm happy I can't contain myself because I have seen something that I've passed on to you that we together will go on in the power of that name, in the power of that glory, we conquer and go on without fear. Even if, even if there comes a time when we have to lay down our life, like uh, Stephen will say, I look up. And I see the glory of God, a Jesus standing at the right of that glory. May the Lord bless you and grant you the revelation of that one thing, glory. Thank you for watching.